All right, uh, let's move on with our um, oxide ion conductors. We have seen in the last class that um, zirconia is a good um, oxide ion conductor because it has the fluoride structure, but it has the fluoride structure only um, at very high temperature. Therefore, it is often uh, doped or has to be doped with lower valent cations. Um, in order to um, stabilize the structure. In addition, by the incorporation of the lower valent cations, such as tritium, for instance, um, or um, calcium, we uh, increase the number of vacancies, which can further uh, increase the ionic um, conductivity. And let's go to the next slide. There are a number of uh, related um, um, compounds that are derived from the uh, fluoride structure. We, we have fluoride structure, but by looking a little bit closer, one can see that they're fluoride structure derived and that I have also good um, oxide ion conductivity in the following I would like to discuss a few of them. So one is called the pyrochlor. It has the composition gadolinium two, titanium two, O seven. Okay. So now you may ask, well, what does that have to do with the fluoride structure? The fluoride structure is associated with the composition um, A, AB two. Yeah. Um, but you can see that relationship when you uh, consider that the pyrochlor is actually a defect fluoride structure. So in fact, one eighth of the oxygens are missing. So if we added that one eighth of oxygens, well, we would arrive at the composition gadolinium two, titanium two, O8, okay? And now you see that this is uh, uh, similar to the composition um, AB2, uh, in the sense that it's, it's two times the formula. So um, AB2 times two is, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, A2B4, okay? And A2B4 times two is A408, okay? It, so it's just, it's just four times, four times the formula unit, okay? And then we do not have four identical um, metal ions A, okay, but we have two different ones, okay. In this case, it's 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 gadolinium and uh, titanium, okay. Now, in addition to that, in the pyrochlor structure, as I said, for one eighth of the oxygen ions are missing. Therefore, this is a defect. Uh, um, Defect uh, fluoride structure. Um, so you see here the overall structure um, <coughs> depicted. We do not know all the details uh, about the structure. Um, the only thing that we may want to keep in mind is that we have here an interpenetrating network of uh, two, two interpenetrating networks. One is a so called A to O network. Okay. So whereby A is in this case um, the gadolinium. So when you see that here, um, the um, A ions are tetrahedrally surrounded by the, by the oxygen. And then you have an, an M2O6 um, network in which you have the other ions, in this case, the titanium um, tetrahedrally surrounded. And you have also network of these tetrahedrally, okay? And these two networks are, are um, interpenetrating. Okay, um, now <clears throat> we can also dope this pyrochlor structure. So um, we can replace some of the gadolinium three plus um, by calcium two plus, for instance, then we have 
have again a lower valent cation in the in the framework, and therefore we have an increased number of um, oxygen defects because we need many less many oxide ions, and that can further increase the um, ionic conductivity. So at 1000 degrees Celsius, the undoped gadolinium to titanium 207 has a conductivity of one times 10 to the minus four Siemens per centimeter. And the activation area, uh, activation barrier for the oxide ions to hop is 0.94 electron volts. If you replace um, some of the gadoliniums by calcium, then the conductivity jumps to five times 10 to the minus two Siemens per centimeter and the activation barrier is lowered because of the introduction of the additional defects to 0 0.63 um, electron volts. Okay, um, so um, the, the fluoride structure is not only the only structure that supports ion conductivity. There are also other structures. Um, for instance, the brown Millerite structure, which can be derived from the peroxide structure um, by removing one sixth of the um, oxygens. So again, at first glance, it's not quite obvious to see what uh, this composition here has to do with the perovskite structure, because remember the perovskite structure has the composition a, uh, A, B, O3, okay? But um, when you consider that uh, we have a defect structure here and add one sixth of the oxygen, then the composition would become barium to indium 206, okay? And that's uh, nothing else but two times the uh, formula ABO3, okay? So if we take that formula, times two, then it would be A2, B2, O6. Okay, so in this case, it would be barium to indium to O6, whereby in the structure, we have a defect structure in the sense that now um, um, one sixth of the oxygen ions are missing. Um, therefore, uh, well, here on five oxygens in the, um, formula units, in the formula unit. Um, so what is the exact, exact structure? So um, there must be certainly um, elements of the peroxide structure. And you see that actually here. So we have here layers of corner sharing um, indium O6, um, indium O6 um, octahedra. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and these are interconnected via uh, near tetrahedral or the near tetrahedral um, layers of um, um, indium or four uh, uh, units. Okay, so that reduced coordination number here at indium within these green layers is because some oxygen ions are miss missing. So it's, it's produced through the oxygen deficiency. Okay, so when you remove um, well, atoms from, corn from two atoms from the corners of octahedra, well, then you will get something which is near tetra. Okay, so um, the barium ions you see here, they're in the void spaces in between these octahedral layers, tetrahedral layers. All right. Um, now, how does um, ion mobility arise here in this structure? So below 800 degrees Celsius, the oxygen vacancies <coughs> in, this, in this structure they are um, ordered, but above 800 degrees Celsius, they become, they become disordered. Um, and um, at this point in time, um, the ion conductivity um, jumps from 10 to minus three Siemens per centimeter 
to 10 to minus one Siemens per uh, centimeter. So that means that the ion connectivity occurs here in the tetrahedral layer primarily because it's less dense and we have here the oxygen vacancies um, localized um, at 800 degrees Celsius. Um, they become disordered um, because of entropic arguments because temperature favors entropy and the ion connectivity is increased from 10 to the minus three Siemens per centimeter to 10 to, 10 to the minus one Siemens per centimeters. All right, um, so here's uh, one more example, um, so-called Aurelius and by me box um, basis. Um, so bismuth um, two tungsten O6 um, is a member of the Aurelius structure family, um, which has ele also elements of the uh, perovskite um, structure. So in this case, you have, as you can see here, again, layers of corner sharing octahedra. Yeah. But now these layers of corner sharing octahedra are uh, separated by layers of uh, Bi2, O2, 2 plus layers. Okay, so these octahedral layers are inionic, and these layers here um, are, are cationic. Okay. Um, so um, Bi4, V2, O11 is a defect or a brilliant space um, where one eighth of the oxygen sites are missing, and they are then missing in the um, octa layer, octa fetal um, layers layers here, which uh, leads to, then to ion conductivity within these, these octahedral layers. So at 600 degrees Celsius, the conductivity is um, already 0 0.2 Siemens uh, per centimeter. It's, it's quite high um, oxide ion conductivity at that um, low temperature. So um, also this um, structure can be um, stabilized um, at lower temperature by doping in that uh, doping then also further increases the ion conductivity. So for instance, one can substitute some of the um, vanadium by um, copper. So here 10% of the vanadium is, is substituted by copper. Um, that stabilizes the uh, uh, phase further at lower temperature, and then also the conductivity increases further to 0 0.01 Siemens per centimeter at all 350 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now let's discuss a few applications of, <coughs> sorry, oxide ion conductors. So one application is an, is an application in what is called a solid oxide fuel cell. You may have heard of that um, application. So in a fuel cell, in the conventional fuel cell, we combine hydrogen and oxygen to form water. Okay, and the free energy of the reaction is converted directly into electrical energy. So in a solid oxide fuel cell, um, we um, use uh, um, oxide solid electrolyte um, in our fuel cell, okay? And the fuel cell is schematically depicted here. So at uh, this uh, end here, we have the um, 
um, anode where the oxidation takes place. And here on the other side, we have the cathode where the uh, reduction takes place. And here in between, we have tritium stabilized zirconia, which as we know is a oxygen ion conductor. We have to run this fuel cell at a very high temperature of about 1000 degrees Celsius in order to um, produce sufficient ion uh, conduct conductivity. So this is one of the disadvantages of the oxide fuel cell. One has to operate it at uh, quite high temperature, otherwise the um, electrolyte material is just not sufficiently uh, ion conductive. So um, what are the electrode materials? So the electrode materials um, have to be both um, ion conductive as well as um, as um, uh, electronically conductive. So at the anode, you use a, a, a composite of nickel and zirconium dioxide. So the zirconium dioxide is again the uh, ion conductive component. And in the nickel is now the elect uh, electron conducting component. At the same time, the nickel actually catalyzes the oxidation of the uh, hydrogen to form H plus ions. Okay. So now, well, the electrons then they travel um, to the um, cathode, and while they travel, they can produce useful power. So the cathode, um, we have another heavy material which is both electronically and as well as oxide ion conductive, um, lanthanum um, manganate LAMNO3. So here, um, oxygen, which is on the cathode side, is getting reduced to form O2 minus anions. So the O2 minus anions can now travel from the cathode to the cathode, because the cathode is also an O2 minus ion conductor, um, through the uh, ytium stabilized zirconia, which is an electrical insulator, but an oxide ion conductor, to the, to the um, um, anode. So at the anode, the O2 minus ions combine with the protons that have been created at the anode to form um, water, okay? The electron uh, can hop coming from the anode, can actually hop on the O2 molecule um, because it has been conducted to the electrical circuit here from the anode to the cathode and because of the lanthanum magnate is also an electron conductor. Okay, um, so another related device is, let's just move over to this now. As an O2 gas sensor that can measure the concentration of oxygen in the gas. Um, so for instance, you have oxygen gas centers, uh, oxygen gas sensors in, um, in cars. Um, and the purpose is to adjust the fuel to oxygen mixture to an ideal um, level. So an oxygen gas sensor um, uses the fact that um, um, concentration gradients create, uh, uh, well, chemical potential, okay? Because when you have oxygen gas at a higher partial pressure in one, well, compartment and oxygen gas at a lower partial pressure in the other compartment, then the pressure, there's a 
thermodynamic driving force for this pressure difference to be eliminated. Okay. So if I had just basically, uh, well, two balloons full of oxygen at different partial pressures and allowed to, um, well, interconnect these two balloons, where the pressure gradient would immediately eliminate and well, at the end of the process, in both balloons, you would have the same partial pressure of oxygen. But in this mode, uh, um, we couldn't uh, create uh, any useful well, electrical um, um, energy from that. So in an oxygen sensor, you do create electrical energy due to the temperature, uh, sorry, the pressure gradient um, of your oxygen gas in different environments. So basically one oxygen, uh, uh, partial pressure is in your, in your reference gas. So that reference gas can be in the most simple case, just the air. Well, and you have a different, oxygen partial pressure in a sample gas that can be, for instance, the exhaust gas in your car. Okay, now these two gases are separated by um, a zirconia electrolyte, okay, which is in contact with two metal electrodes here and here. Okay, and now because of the different oxygen partial pressures here and here, um, actually a voltage builds up in between these two electrodes. Well, and the voltage is uh, directly proportional to the difference between um, these two pressures here. So in, par in particular, the voltage is equal to R times T over 4F times Ln uh, of the reference pressure um, over um, the sample pressure. So how can we understand that there's a potential building up? Um, well, that is because on the left side, yeah, we <clears throat> can reduce oxygen um, with um, four electrons in order to produce oxide minus um, anions, okay? And these oxide minus anions, they then can travel through the zirconia electrolyte because the zirconia is uh, oxide ion conductor. So on the other side, okay, um, these uh, O2 minus anions can then be oxidized and produce O2 and four electrons. And these four electrons can then travel to the um, left. Uh, electrodes. So this is the cathode here because we have either reduction and this is the anode here um, where we have the oxidation. So you see that when you actually sum up these two equations, okay, then this results in nothing else but an overall traveling of oxygen molecules to the zirconia electrolyte to the other side. So eventually the pressure gradient will eliminate. Okay, when we have measured that pressure gradient through the potential that has um, built up here. Okay. Of course, again, such a pressure sensor uh, O2 gas sensor in this case can only operate at sufficiently high temperatures. So only above 60, uh, uh, 650 degrees Celsius 
the oxide ion conductivity is uh, of the zirconia electrolyte is high enough in order to do, make this device uh, working sufficiently well. All right, um, now we have discussed um, thus far um, materials that have either electronic conductivity or they have ionic conductivity, but um, there are also materials that have both electronic conductivity and ion conductivity. And those uh, materials are particularly interested, uh, particularly interesting in um, batteries, um, for instance, lithium ion batteries. Yeah? Um, and they find applications as electrode materials. <coughs> electrode material, you have to have both electronic conductivity and ion conductivity. So in a lithium ion battery, for instance, you typically have a graphite intercalation compound with the approximate formula uh, LiC6 um, in the charged state and uh, 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 lithium cobalt oxide is, is the cal cathode. So um, both structures are layered structures that allow for both ionic conductivity and electron conductivity within the materials. So um, in this lithium ion battery here, upon discharge, basically, um, electrons would um, move out of the carbon sheets, okay, and go through a load to the cathode, where they would basically add to the um, lithium cobaltate, okay? Now, because we remove electrons from the graphite sheet here to order to charge balance, we must also uh, remove lithium plus from them. So these lithium plus ions, they can then uh, move through the um, electrolyte, um, which is actually typically a solution in of uh, um, lithium hexafluorophosphate in organic solvent to the cathode. And at the cathode, they well, intercalate into the um, lithium cobalt oxide. So what structures um, do the cathode and the anode have um, in particular. So let us first look at the lithium um, cobaltate. And in this case, we have a structure which derives from the cadmium chloride structure. Remember when we discussed the cadmium chloride structure, um, we talked about a structure in which um, we have a cubic closed pack structure in which 50% of the octahedral holes are being filled in a layered fashion, okay? So in this case, we have a cubic closed pack structure of oxide ions. And now 50% of the octahedral holes are occupied by the cobalt in a layered fashion, okay? So that gives layers of, uh, Edge sharing cobalt O6 of the heater. You see those here. Okay. And into these uh, sheets, then in between these sheets, we can then um, intercalate um, lithium ions. So the lithium ions are sitting here in between the sheets. Okay. So now the cobalt is a redox well, active uh, metal. So as we oxidize the cobalt, we will have, we will need more lithium in between 
these streets and every as we had uh, cobalt in the lower bound see um, um, we will have uh, less many uh, lithium ions in between the sheets. No, sorry, it's the other way around. So if the oxidation state of the cobalt increases, we have more positive charges. So we need less many lithium ions. If the oxidation state of the cobalt is lower, then we have less many positive charges in the cobalt. So we need more positive charges. In between these layers in order to charge compensate the negative charges of the oxygen. Okay. So within these octahedral sheets here, we have good um, electrical conductivity, um, but we also have good ion conductivity because these lithium ions in between these octahedral layers can fairly easily move in and out of the material, okay? However, um, there are certain limitations to this. So the lithium D intercalation can only vary between zero and uh, 0 0.5. So you can only remove about 50% of the lithium ion from um, the compound L A L I C O2. If you actually move less, uh, if you move out, move more lithium ions out of that structure, the structure becomes unstable and the reintercalation doesn't work anymore. So you must always leave a certain number of lithium ions in between these sheets. Otherwise, you will destabilize the chemical system too much and the uh, layers uh, start to uh, collapse. So um, the capacity of uh, that electrode is about 45 ampere hours per kilogram. So ampere hours is nothing else but uh, unit for the charges that you can actually store in the electrode material. So one ampere hours um, refers to approximately 3,600 um, coulombs, okay? Um, when you pair this electrode with uh, uh, radiated carbon counter electrode, then you can achieve a voltage um, of about 3.5. Seven volt, and that results then at an energy density of 165 watt hours per kilogram. So the energy density is nothing else but the voltage within the cell, well, times the charges that you can store within the cell. Okay. So the lithium cobaltate is um, currently still the most commonly used cathode material in lithium ion batteries, but uh, the cobalt is actually relatively expensive and therefore there's a lot of research going on or replacing cobalt by less expensive element, for instance, titanium, nickel, and manganese. So one electrode material, um, which is less expensive, um, is the, uh, but its other disadvantage first is the lithium um, titanium S2. So this is also a layered structure. Um, this layered structure is derived from the cadmium iodide structure. And as you know, in the cadmium iodide structure, we have a hexagonal, hexagonal closed packed structure of anions with 50% of the octahedral sites being occupied in the layered fashion. So in this case, um, um, sulfide ions make the hexagonally closed packed structure and 50% of the octahedral holes are occupied by titanium. Okay, so again, you have a sheet um, structure here. Um, so pure titanium sulfide is a semi-metal and the conductivity further increases um, as you insert lithium because you actually, uh, well, fill, um, start filling electrons into the conduction band and then 
um, your material becomes a true um, metallic metallic conductor. So in this case, you have actually a wider range of lithium insertion possible. It can vary between zero and one. So you can actually fully remove the lithium ions um, without destroying your electrode, electrode material. Um, for that reason, you can actually produce a higher uh, capacity. You can store more charges for up to 250 MP hours per gram, but you have actually significantly lower voltage um, which is only 1.9 um, volts in comparison to the lithium covoltate um, electrode. So this is the main limitation of the titanium sulfide uh, cathode. The energy density is uh, uh, the product of the capacity and the voltage, which is in this case about 481 volts per kilogram. All right, so now let's have a um, closer look at the um, anode material. So we said that the anode material is a lithium uh, intercalation compound of graphite. So for that reason, let us look more closely um, at uh, graphite intercalation compounds in general. So um, you all know the structure of graphite. Okay, so in graphite, we have graphene sheets of, well, hexagonal uh, carbon six rings, which are um, all interconnected to form, to form sheets. Okay. Um, so now it is possible to intercalate <coughs> ions or so molecules in between these sheets. And then you have what is called a graphite intercalation compound. So how do we classify these? Um, so one way to classify them is by the so-called stage number. And the stage number is defined as the number of graphene sheets um, between the inter uh, calate. Okay, so for instance, if we have an intercalate um, in between every graphene sheet, okay, we say that stage number n is equal to one. Okay, if we intercalate an ion or a molecule um, in between every two, Graphene sheets, then the stage number is n equal to two. If we intercalate um, a layer of intercalates in between every three graphene sheets, then we have stage number of three. Okay, so n can be as high as eight. Um, so basically, that gives um, repeating units in the c direction of of approximately up of approximately up to three. Um, nanometers, okay? So the repeating units given by the lattice spacing IC, um, and that is nothing else but essentially the sandwich thickness, okay? So that is this thickness here. Okay, the distance between two layers, that graphene layers, graphene sheets that are intercalated plus 0.335 nanometers. Okay, that's just the distance, regular distance between two graphene, layer, graphene layers, such as this here, times n minus one. Okay, so stage number minus one. Okay, um, so now let us look at, um, some stage one GICs, um, graphite intercalation compounds that are relevant for the um, batteries. So um, 
with lithium, we can produce um, stage one GRCs of the composition um, MC6. Um, if we, inter we can also intercalate earth alkali matter, they also produce compositions MC6. If we use um, metal ions of larger radius, such as um, cesium, rubidium, um, and potassium, for example, then these form graphite intercalation compounds of the composition MC8. Okay, so we see both structures schematically shown here. Um, so the MC8 compounds meet the so called 2A times the square root of 3A super lattice. So basically, this just describes how the um, metal ions are arranged in between these sheets. Okay, so you see that the metal ions sit in the center of the hexagons. Okay, so now in this direction here, they are 2A apart, okay, whereby A is nothing else but the distance between two edges of one particular hexagon. Okay, so this is 1A. Okay, so here we have another half A, and here we have another half A. So that gives overall 2A. So in this direction here, we are going uh, from the center of the hexagon to the corner. And well, Relative to 1a, we have here a distance of the square root of 3a due to geometric, geometric arguments. Okay, so we can say that the uh, metal ions are arranged in a 2a times the square root of 3a super lattice within the graphite intercalation compound. So over here, um, we have um, a higher density of alkaline uh, metal um, ions. <coughs> we have a so-called the square root of A times the square root of A super lattice. Okay. You see that here. Um, we have the lithium ions um, basically on a unit cell between the super lattice that extends from the center of a hexagon to the corner and goes along it and then goes from the corner to another center of another hexagon. And that is basically true for uh, both um, edges of the unit cell of that super lattice here. So for um, a battery electrode material, you would like to store as many charges as possible in your material. Um, so therefore, you will certainly prefer a stage one graphite intercalation compound um, with lithium. So at ambient pressure, the lithium content is well restricted to the composition of lithium to carbon being one to six. So however, when you use high pressure, you can increase that um, lithium ion content um, further to lithium C2. You can do this just by mixing the um, alkali metal with graphite at about 60 um, kilobar to form that uh, compound. So why does the lithium intercalate? Um, at first glance, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense given that the graphite sheets actually come further apart from each other and pressure actually tends to um, um, support phases of higher density over phases with lower density. However, we need to consider that a pure alkali metal is actually quite low density, okay? So by intercalating that lithium into the 
uh, graphite sheet, we actually increase the density of the overall system. Okay, alkali metal plus graphite. And in fact, the volume reduction is about um, 48 percent um, for this reaction here. So this is about as high as we can go because now we have actually every carbon six hexagon centered by uh, lithium ion. So unfortunately, this uh, phase is actually not stable after quenching. If we uh, reduce the pressure back to amine atmosphere, the structure becomes stable and automatically expels um, lithium. Otherwise, it would be actually quite interesting for um, battery application. Okay, um, there are also other um, graphite intercalation compounds known. Um, we cannot only intercalate um, earth alkali metals and alkali metals. We can also uh, include anions. So for instance, when you just um, heat um, graphite in concentrated, in a mixture of concentrated sulfuric acid and nitric acid, then the graphite sheet becomes oxidized and bisulfide anions and Sulfuric so acid molecules are getting intercalated in between the um, graphene sheets. Now, this intercalation then also further increases the electronic uh, conductivity because um, now electrons are being removed from the balance band. So the balance band becomes partially. Um, filled. Of course, the interlayer distance increases due to the intercalation, in this case, from 0 0.335 to 0 0.798 nanometers. You don't have to memorize these numbers. So, also, um, um, other compounds can be intercalated, for instance, metal salts like aluminum chloride, iron chloride, um, silver chloride. All the fluorides can be intercalated, for instance, um, arsenic pentafluoride and timony pentafluoride. Also, halogens can be intercalated. So, for example, chlorine and bromine react with graphite to form second stage halogen graphite. So, we have in this case halogen molecules, Cl2 and Br2, in between the graphite. Um, sheets. If you try the same thing with fluorine, then because of the even higher reactivity of fluorine, the fluorine really adds to the carbon-carbon double bonds within the graphite, and you get a compound which is called graphite fluoride at temperature 400 to 600 degrees Celsius. So in this case, the hybridization of the uh, carbon changes, and um, for that reason, the sheets are then not planar anymore, but you have um, cyclohexane like sheets in its um, chair um, conformation, whereby the fluorines point alternately uh, up and down away from the um, um, sheets. So, um, this compound, uh, graphite, named graphite fluoride, is not an uh, electronic conductor. It's actually uh, uh, insulated due to the absence of the pi electrons that can electronically conduct. All right. Um, then we are at the end of the chapter about um, ionic conductivity. And um, we have another exam coming up next Monday. So this uh, class today will be the last uh, class that will count toward the um, next exam because from Wednesday on, we will start um, a new chapter and that new chapter will then count toward the um, fourth exam.
So at the very end, again, I wanted to 